So our first lecture should be about crystal structure. What is it? Uh, we need to define a few basic terms. Again, many of those you might have heard, but I'm not sure whether you have heard those in English. So let's uh, repeat them once more. Uh, we will be talking here about crystalline materials. And those are materials that uh, exhibit themselves that, uh, that show a regular arrangement of atoms. Uh, when they show the regular arrangement of atoms, we can use some basic mathematical tools to describe this. And uh, we will define a coordinate system with basis vectors. We have typically three dimensional cases. So the D, capital D, will be the dimension number three. We will have three basis vectors that then fully describe the translational symmetry of our system. That means the whole lattice will be then, uh, will be then defined by a set of points, these points T, uh, and each of these points is an integer multiple of the lattice vectors. So each of these points will be actually given by this triplet N1, N2, N3. Uh, the basis vectors, they define a primitive cell. So the volume, which is um, bordered by these three vectors, in the case of three-dimensional lattice, uh, will be called a primitive cell. The volume of this primitive cell is linked to the primitive or to the basis vectors using the equations given here. And uh, during the uh, first Moodle problem that is, uh, I think, already available at Moodle, uh, you will be able to uh, apply this equation to derive the volume of a primitive cell hexagonal system or BCC like this. I do not, or maybe FCC, I don't remember now exactly, all right? What about lower dimensional lattices? Let's start with those. So when we have one dimensional lattice, what is it? A one dimensional lattice is essentially a series of points in the space. So this is what we have here, a question how many different choices of basis vectors do we have for 1D lattice? I showed here one, but can we define, can we choose another basis vector which would define exactly the same lattice? Other direction, very well, yeah? So, we have a vector A, which goes this direction, or we can have a vector B, which is minus A. Right? And that defines exactly the same lattice. Okay? Do we have any other vector that we can use to generate the same lattice? There's now a binary question, yes or no? No. No, no, very good. So we have really just these two options, right? That's that's beauty of the 1D lattice. And when it comes to 2D lattice, and I would plot this series of points I have here, right, this is, as it's shown, and I ask you to tell me what are the lattice vectors. I believe that most of you would intuitively give me these vectors. Oh, sorry, I can't draw anymore. These two vectors. At least that's what I would do. This is the most obvious ones, the most intuitive ones. But of course, the choice here is not unique. I'm already showing here three examples, two more examples of lattice vectors, this one and this one. They generate exactly the same lattice as well. Remember, the lattice is just a set of the points. I do not, at the end of the day, I do not care about how do I generate these points. All what I will see are the points without the vectors. This is my lattice. 
not the basis vectors themselves. These are generators. And the lattice is the set of the points in the space. So obviously these vectors A and B generate the same lattice, right? I can use vector A to come from here to there, to there, to there, to everywhere here. Then I use the uh, vector B to jump to another column of the points. And then I would be adding the vector A and I can generate all of these points. So obviously A and B will generate exactly the same lattice. What about these two vectors? Do they generate also the same lattice? It's again a binary, right? Yes or no? Yes, for sure, sure, sure. Oh yeah, now it comes the bombardment. Very good, very good, very good. That was probably too stupid, too easy question. So yes, yeah, they, they, they do indeed. Um, what about these two guys? Do they generate the same lattice? Ah, uh, now we have already some yes or no. So the majority of you says yes. And there were a few of you who said no. And those who said no were correct. Those two vector point, uh, vectors do not generate the same lattice. I do not have a possibility how to take their integer multiples to come to this point, right? If I take this vector, I will be probing all of these points here. Then I moved using this vector here and I'll be probing all of these points. Then I take again the B and I'll be probing all of these. So I will never come to neither of these yellow crosses using these two vectors. I will have one last question to you. What about these guys? Do they generate the same lattice? Yeah. I should really make this somehow interactive counting yes and no's. So whoever now says yes, which seems to be majority is correct, right? These two vectors, they define exactly the same lattice. Again, if I follow this vector, I will get to these point. Then I take this second vector, move one line apart, and then, okay, so this and that. I take this green vector to move to this point, and then I will be adding a multiples of the red vector to move to these points. Right? And then from any of these, I would take the green one again, move, for example, to this point, and again, use the multiples of the red one to generate all of these points. So yes, I can using the, this red vector and this green vector, which is in the meantime, getting red as well, I can generate the whole lattice. And so is there a way how I can immediately spot whether my two vectors that I choose define the lattice or not? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, that if I draw a paralleloid based on my vectors, then the volume should contain exactly one lattice point. If you imagine the example that the correct answer was no, that they do not generate the lattice, then the paralleloid looks like this. And it contains actually one extra point here. It contains quarter of this point, quarter of that, quarter of that, quarter of that, which gives me one point, one lattice point per this volume, plus one more point. So there are two lattice points per volume. And therefore, these two, vectors, they do not generate exactly the same lattice as we see here. They do generate lattice. They do generate lattice, 
but the lattice contains half of the points than what we see in this picture and that's what we are aiming at generating. So, to sum it up, the basis vectors are not unique and therefore the primitive cell is not uniquely def defined. And each primitive cell contains exactly one lattice point. So this is the way how you can, oh God, how you can um, distinguish between, uh, you can distinguish uh, between a set of factors that generate the lattice and those which do not generate the lattice. So we have here an example of a 2D lattice that you know from graphene, it's hexagonal lattice. We call it a hexagonal lattice, but is it really a lattice? If you think about the mesh of the atoms, these hexagons that we have at the right bottom corner, do they really generate or do they really uh, correspond to a lattice? In other words, can you think of two vectors that generate a hexagonal mesh like this? And the answer is you cannot think about it, right? Uh, or you, you can think about it, but the correct answer will be, you will not be able to come up with two vectors that generate such lattice that we have here. So then we are coming to the concept of a lattice and motif. In order to get crystal structure, what we actually saw there was not a lattice, but that was really a crystal structure that was graphene, it was arrangement of atoms. Yes, we saw there some periodicity, uh, so we are inclined to ascribe it to a certain lattice, but the lattice is not in such a way that each atom corresponds to one lattice point. And so what we need to do is that when we define the lattice as this set of virtual points in the space, we then need to combine them with a motif which is a certain pattern, certain arrangement of atoms. And then this motif is put in a copy-paste fashion to each of these lattice points. And only then, when you have this arrangement of atoms, you call it a crystal structure, right? So here is one motif which sits at this lattice point. Here is another motif which sits at this lattice point and so on and so forth. Here is an example of artistic uh, thinking about what are the motifs and what are the primitive cells. Um, you can try to draw this yourself or figure out what would be the um, Unit cells, for example, for these guys, we would go always from mouth to mouth, right? And that would give us a primitive cell, of course. But it's not unique, right? So I can go also from here to there, and this would be our primitive cell. Same thing here, I can go from eye to eye, which is a little bit morbid, right? Oh, it's a wrong eye, it should be to this. Or I can go from leg to leg, I just need to find out the same leg always from this guy to this leg and here and back and so on. All of these are the primitive cells. Uh, what would be the primitive cell for these guys here? Well, again, we can go, for example, from cup to cup, right? This generates us the pattern. So if you would take whatever is inside this cup, and you periodically repeat it here, you get exactly this infinite pattern that we see here. Brilliant. But if I now delete it and you look at this as well, doesn't this look actually like a hexagonal cell? 
So here we have some hexagon, right? And it looks with this hexagonal pattern, we have always here these trousers in there. Mm. So maybe this should be directing us to what is then the lattice that will be ascribed to a hexagonal cell such as graphene. So if we now take the lattice, which corresponds to two vectors that have 60 degrees between them and are both with the same length. And then inside of each of these paralleloids, we would put two atoms as it's shown here. We put there this motif. We actually arrive at this arrangement of atoms. What you will see in reality are just these orange atoms, right? You will not see the bonds. This is just how we connect them. You will not see the lattice points because this is just our helper mesh. How to always put the two atoms. So all what you will see are actually the orange atoms here, these guys. And then when you see them, you will intuitively connect them with this honeycomb structure. But remember how we obtained it? We obtained it by putting the two atomic motif into this paralleloid uh, scheme of repetition. The unit cell is now the periodically repeated pattern which fills the whole space. So this is essentially our primitive cell, which was the part of the lattice together with the motif. The unit cell is typically defined by three basis vectors. If we talk about 3D lattice, right? So A, B, C, or it is defined by six lattice parameters, A, B, C, alpha, beta, and gamma where alpha, beta, and gamma are the angles between the three vectors, the three vectors of length A and B and C. So this is what you know for cubic materials means that A equals B equals C and all the three angles are 90 degrees and so on and so forth. Now think about it a little bit more uh, mathematically. When we have three vectors, A, B, and C in 3D, how many numbers do I need to define three vectors? Nine, you won the game. <laughs> exactly, I need nine numbers. But then below I say, I need six lattice parameters. Each of these lattice parameters is a number on its own. It's a real number, ABC corresponding to length, alpha, beta, gamma corresponding to angles. So I do have here a certain perpetuum mobile, right? I use six numbers and say that this is equivalent to nine numbers, which define the basis vectors. Where is the catch? Where are the remaining three numbers? Well, the point is that if you think about six lattice vectors, they might define a cubic cell like that. But the cubic cell might be also defined like that or like that and so on. And of course, if I worry about elastic properties, for example, of my cubic aluminum, I do worry about the Young's modules in this direction, along this, Young's, uh, along this uh, lattice direction. But I do not worry about the fact that my crystal in the lab is oriented from window to doors or from the floor to the ceiling. I don't care about this. Whenever I take the cube, I take the sample and I apply a load to it along the same crystallographic axis, it should be the same. Now the three lattice vectors, A, B, and C, they define the orientation of my lattice, of my crystal structure, not only uh, geometrically, but also with respect to a reference uh, a reference coordinate 
frame, which is, well, typically my laboratory, right? So A, B, and C, if I really specify all A, B, and C, they actually define whether my cube sample is oriented this way or whether it's oriented that way or to you. But all what I worry about is, is it cubic? Yes, and if it is, I apply my load along this axis from left to right uh, facet of my crystal, all right? So the three missing numbers, you can say these are, for example, the Euler numbers. These are the uh, Euler angles, which would define how is your crystal oriented in space. And so eventually there is no disagreement between these, uh, these definitions. Beekner sites cell. What is this? This is a very special primitive cell. So it's again, a part of the volume which contains only one atom, but it is not uh, a paralleloid given by the lattice vectors. It is a part of the volume of this whole space that can be periodically repeated, absolutely, to fill the whole space. And it's constructed in such a way that I take a certain point, a certain lattice point, then I take all other points in the space and always plot the plane, which is perpendicular to the connection of my point of interest and that given plane point in the space and cuts this connection in the half, right? So all of these planes, I'm oh, sorry, I cannot, cannot draw here on the screen very well. Uh, so this would give me this. If I now take more points in the space, of course, these are also lattice points and I should include them in the analysis as well. But for example, the connection between this and that point and the plane which goes through the middle is this one. Right? So essentially the volume, which is fully contained within this whole infinite number of planes, the small, the, the volume which is completely bounded by that will be eventually this one here. And this volume uh, is, has the same volume as the paralleloid, can be also uh, repeated in space to fully uh, cover the space. And this Wigner side cell is then used mostly in the reciprocal space to define so-called first Berlin zone. And we will talk about that uh, in a second and then later on in the course a lot. Another cell is so-called conventional cell. And this is something that all of you know when we start talking about face-centered cubic systems or body-centered cubic systems, then all of you would think about a cube coming from this C at the end. KFZ, KFZ in German, and always this K at the beginning, kub, kubisch, hopefully it's correct, kubisch, uh, corresponds to this cubic cell. However, this cell is not, uh, is not a primitive cell, right? It actually does not contain a smallest cell, that, that can be used for uh, filling the whole space. The primitive cell here for uh, FCC, for example, is the one which is shown here and which is defined by the vectors that connect always the corner of the cube with the center of the facet. So I get these, uh, these three vectors, A1, A2, A3. And these three vectors, define this strange shape that we have here, this uh, uh, rhombohedral that uh, can be used to uh, actually fill the whole space and contain exactly one lattice point, right? Again, here we talk about lattice. It's a face center cubic lattice. This is not necessarily a crystal. So these points here, this is not an aluminum atom. No, 
This is a lattice point at which I will be putting in a second the motif to generate my crystal structure. The same thing for BCC. Again, when it comes to BCC cell, we typically draw a Q and a point in the middle. But actually the cell that defines this lattice contains uh, only one lattice point and is generated by vectors which connect a corner of the cube with the centers of the cubes surrounding this one cube. And again, inside of this shape, inside of this paralleloid, you will find exactly one lattice point. There is no more lattice points in there. Good, lattice systems. I think we can skip this also for the sake of time. You have seen that a billion times during the study. So we have seven lattice systems. These can be combined with the centerings which actually leads to the 14 Bravais lattices, okay? So these are now the Bravais lattices, which can be used to define some of the simple element crystal structures, but I want to bring you now to the connection between the Bravais lattice so we do have the lattices now and the motif and to finally obtain the crystal structure. This is now maybe something new to you, right? So when we talk about FCC cell, FCC structure, you would imagine this cell and each of these points here would be an atom. And we obtain in such a way, for example, the aluminum structure, typical crystal structure here. Right, the atoms here, the orange points, this is now my crystal structure. And the way how I obtained it is that in each lattice point, I put one atom. But I can put there also two atoms, right? I can put in each of these lattice points, I can put actually two atoms and the two atoms are titanium together with nitrogen. So when I put such motif into each of these lattice points, then I get this uh, sodium chloride structure. Look at this. If you are colorblind and you do not see the gray color here, you would actually see exactly the same picture as we have here for the aluminum. All these blue atoms, they sit exactly at the same uh, sides at the same um, spatial arrangement as the orange points here for aluminum, right? So what we are now putting is that we take this motif, two atoms, and we put it in each of these lattice sides and obtain a different crystal structure. We have the same lattice, we obtain a different crystal structure. We can go further, we still can keep the two atoms but now we arrange them differently. So instead of having this dumbbell of atoms, the titanium and nitrogen, instead of having them along the cube axis, we now put them along the cube body diagonal. And this way we obtain the uh, gallium arsenide structure, All right? So while in the sodium chloride structure, each atom has six nearest neighbors, and these six nearest neighbors are of the opposite chemical type in our binary system. Then in the gallium arsenide structure, each species has four nearest neighbors of the opposite type. So each orange atom has four green nearest neighbors. Right? Again, the same lattice, now we would say even the same or very similar type of motif. The motif is just geometrically differently oriented and we obtain completely different crystal structure. Now you would say that these different crystal structures are a domain for two species, right? Titanium nitrogen, sodium chloride, 
gallium arsenide. But this is not the case. Think about the gallium arsenide structure and put there just silicon atoms or only carbon atoms. You end up with exactly the same arrangement of atoms. And again, maybe the colorblind people here might be, uh, might be happy not to recognize the difference between orange and, and green, right? You would see everything in single color and you get the diamond structure. The same one as it's for silicon, the same one as it's for germanium. So again, coming back to the relationship between silicon and aluminum, both of them being single species structure, we have the same lattice, FCC lattice, but here we have a motif with single atom, here we have a motif with two atoms. It leads to a completely different crystal structure. So um, how do we then uh, quantify these uh, different crystal structures? Uh, we need a little bit of mathematical background for this. We need a, a bit of crystallography and we will use symmetry operations. So for each atom, we look at its nearest neighborhood and then we see that the silicon in the right top structure has a different local environment, different local neighborhood than the aluminum in the left bottom structure. And now this different local environment, the kind of symmetries that we can apply to these neighborhoods will uh, lead eventually to the definition of the symmetry operations, which all together then define so-called point group. So the point symmetries that we have are rotations. We can take the local environment rotated along a certain high symmetry axis uh, n times and each rotation yields to the same uh, configuration. How do I imagine this is that I close my eyes, some of you rotates the crystal, I open the eyes and I will not spot any difference, right? So this way we can get uh, two, three, four or six folded rotation rotational axis. So typically for the hexagonal system, right? This is the uh, six-fold uh, rotational axis. If you think about the uh, diamond structure that we have here and we look at the one, one, one axis, well, this is a three-fold uh, rotational axis. It might be better seen if you look at this body, body diagonal that we have here and you think about this atom, this uh, yellow one, or we look at this, this axis and we start now rotating it along this axis, right? So if I rotate it from this atom by 120 degrees to here, from this one here, 120 degrees and 120 degrees here, each time, each rotation by 120 degrees leads to exactly the same configuration. Again, if I close my eyes, perform the rotation and open my eyes, I will not see any difference. This is, uh, this is the point for this uh, point symmetries. I can have also reflection planes as it's written here. So that corresponds to something like this, that you have really a mirror plane. You look at the configuration of atoms on one side, on the other side, it's just a reflected configuration. We can have an inversion, that means we have a certain of inversion. And if I see an atom in a certain direction, I would take exactly this direction, but opposite. Uh, so the same vector, but opposite direction. I also would find their identical, identical atom. And uh, the rot inversion is the uh, connection of the two symmetries. So this is an end time rotational axis together with the inversion. So that means that I take my crystal lattice, I rotate it and invert the atoms uh, leading to exactly the same configuration, right? So if I would have, do I have here an example? Let me see. No, I don't have an example here. Um, rot inversion might be, uh, Oh, sorry, 
that might be exactly what is actually applied if you would think about it a little bit more carefully uh what is the again the case of this 111 axis so if you would now rotate it not by 120 degrees to get it here but if you rotate it just by 60 degrees then the atoms would be somewhere here in the middle right in, in between so this guy comes here uh, this guy comes here and this one would come in the middle but then at this point for this rotation if you would uh, apply the mirror axis with respect to this atom so something like this you well, and then you say this atom is exactly the same atom you would come to these three atoms right so this is actually the example of the rot inversion it's a bit hard to show it here in these 2d pictures the best would be if you either draw it yourself or if you figure out uh, how to make a 3d model on the computer and play around We have also translational symmetries, which are apart from the pure translation. So that's basically the repetition of the cell uh, that we have also the screw axis. That means we uh, move and rotate as we are moving. So it's not the inversion together with the rotation, but it's the translation together with the rotation. Or we have a glide plane, which is a translation together with the uh, mirror plane. Right, so we actually mirror the guy, but at the same time we move it as well. Then we mirror it again and translate. So all of these are the symmetry operations that can bring our local environment to exactly the same local environment. Uh, there are altogether 32 different crystallographic point groups. Uh, which can be found and that define the local environments. Here, here is a table uh, as taken from the book of uh, Martin Dove from the structure and dynamics. So it's from this book. Now these point groups, they can be combined with the 14 Bravais lattices, which then all together generates 230 space groups, which can be used to uh, classify all the crystals, not quasi-crystals, but all crystals that we have uh, that we have available, right? So each crystal uh, based on its space group, which contains the information about the point group, the local symmetries, plus the probabilities, so how the uh, motifs are distributed inside of the cell. Each of the crystal can be classified into one of these 230 space groups. And the question is, what is actually a space group, right? So a space group is a, a physical or material science term, which is based on the mathematical object group and group is a set. Set is something that you all know. We have a set of numbers, integer numbers, real numbers, and so on, together with an operation. And we have a couple of requests on this operation, plus the members of this set that have to be fulfilled in order to call this pair, set, and operation a group. One of them is closure. That means whenever I apply the operation on two of my members of the set, I get another member of the set. I never leave out my playground by combining the, uh, the, the members of my playground and the operation. I also need to satisfy associativity. So that means it does not matter if I have the three operations uh, or two operations in a row, it does not matter which of these I evaluate as a first, if the first or the second. Of course, what could matter is the, uh, is the order, right? No one says that uh, this uh, associativity means that I have also C times B times A equals A times B times C. This is not the case. 
And you know, for example, the matrix multiplication, which means the whole set of matrices plus the operation of matrix multiplication forms a group mathematically, but it is not commutative in this sense, right? A commutative group is a special subset of groups that fulfill in addition to these four basic, uh, basic requests, also fulfill the commutativity uh, request. Identity means that the group must contain a special element, uh, a special element uh, which uh, whenever I apply this operation to any other element in the group, I get the same element. And also an existence of an inverse element that means that if I multiply any element with its, or multiply, I apply the operation on a pair of element and inverse element, I get this uh, identity element. There was a question in the in the chat. What are what are uh, what are P, I, C, and F? All right. Uh, these are the different centerings. So um, page fifteen. Page fifteen. That is that is far. Hmm. Exactly here, right? These numbers, P, I, F, and C, depends on how you uh, apply a different so called centerings uh, to the seven lattice systems that we had on the previous slide in order to obtain so-called conventional or these right, these conventional cells. So if you would take, for example, the cubic, this is I think the most obvious one, then you take the cubic lattice and you combine it with a centering, any of these primitive body-centered or face-centered, which then allows to define a conventional cell with this high symmetry still keeping it cubic but not being a lattice in terms of the crystallography we then obtain the Bravais lattice right so then actually the bcc Bravais lattice that we have here is a combination of a cubic lattice system with a body centered centering meaning that inside of my primitive cell, I enter two lattice points. So the green ones are one lattice point, the orange one is the second lattice point. Now, if I think about such lattice, I can, of course, define it as a lattice as well. And the lattice, would be with these strange vectors, as we said before, going from here and here and to these other neighboring cells, right? Or in the face-centered cubic, you would have the um, primitive cell defined by these three vectors going to the centers of the facets. But it's convenient to talk about the conventional cells, which are these Bravais lattices, and the Bravais lattices are again a combination of the lattice system with a certain centering. Does that clarify it a little bit? Not each lattice system and each centering is reasonable to be combined. Yeah, good. Because for example, if you would now take the tetragonal cell and you would combine it with a uh, centering where the one atom, so this would be the, if we say this is A, B, and C, so this would be the C centering on the C plane, uh, then if we, if we at such a point, we actually do not obtain any higher symmetry structure. We obtain a structure which can be equally well described by this tetragonal structure. Okay, so it's again a tetragonal structure. So 
C-plane centered tetragonal structure does not exist as a Bravais lattice because it is essentially just a tetragonal lattice. The same thing is why we have no C-plane centered cubic structure. Well, because it would be actually just a tetragonal structure. All right. So this is why some of these combinations of lattice system and the centerings are excluded and why we do not have four times four centerings times seven crystal systems, why we do not have 28 Bravais lattices, but only 14 of them. So we make a jump forward. All right, so here is an example what you can uh, figure out then uh, later on, on your own. An example of the space group that we have here is, for example, a matrix of atomic positions here. Um, oh, sorry, the, yeah. Uh, is, is, is a matrix, right, and, and T, sorry, this is not yet, uh, anything to do with the uh, atomic positions, and then we have a translation. So if we define a set of such objects, always matrix and translation, uh, and we combine it with an operation, which is defined this way, you can show that this operation together with such objects forms a group. How? Well, basically by proving that all of these uh, requirements on the group are fulfilled, which if I'm not mistaken is done actually right, is done on this slide. So I'm not going to do the details here. You can work it out on your own. And uh, that actually defines you a set of the lattice points, right? So that exactly tells you uh, how you apply the symmetry operations on the lattice points in order to generate another lattice points. You go from a lattice point, you apply some rotation, which is the matrix plus a translation, and you have to come to another lattice point. That is the whole thing. So basically, if we have then a symmetry operation, and symmetry operation is a really uh, a connection or, or uh, a pair of rotation plus translation. It means that when you apply it on any of the lattice points, you have to come up to another lattice point. Uh, this last example here again, which you can figure out yourself, says uh, what are the, uh, the, the rotational matrices simply are uh, also forming a group. So this is a subset of what is shown before in a more general way, because this is with zero translation. So these different crystal systems that we have here, um, actually we should make a, a somehow the thicker line between these guys, right? So the underlying lattice here is always the FCC. That's what we had before, whereas here the underlying lattice is BCC, they all of them have different space group. And this is how they really differ, how you see that we obtain a different uh, crystal structure. And even for these two, if you now look at them, they do have a different space group. That means a different set of these local environments. Simply the fact is that I can easily, so in this case, in the case of the diamond structure, I can find operations which map blue atoms on blue, but these mappings here would be green on uh, yellow atom. That means that if I close my eyes, perform the operation, and I open my eyes again, I would see the crystal uh, inverted which of course I would not recognize for the diamond structure because all atoms are identical, right? So that is why these two crystal systems do not have the same space group. The diamond structure has or contains more symmetry operations. A short note on Fourier transformations. Uh, 
uh, it's a kind of a mixture of different parts of information from there and here. Uh, but we will work with this a lot, a lot during the uh, later part of this uh, of this course, and we will need this for the the, the diffraction part of the lecture as well. Fourier transformation uh, is something which helps us to describe any periodic system, which um, and, and the continuous quantity, this periodic system, using a few discrete values. An example is shown here. We have a continuous signal, which is obviously periodic. The Fourier transformation now says that this periodic signal, which is periodic, but it's probably difficult to be uh, described in single term in simple terms because it's not a, a sine function, it's not a cosine function, it's a periodic function, right? But it can be decomposed into a contribution of certain sine functions. This purple one, the green one, the blue one, the yellow one, and so on and so forth. And each of these functions, which has a discrete frequency, a discrete period, right? So each of them, each of the next one has a higher frequency discretely defined by the number of n, has a certain weight in the overall infinite sum. And if I would know this set of weights, these coefficients, these Fourier coefficients, then I have a full description of my periodic, but otherwise crazy function. So what we have done is that we transform a continuous information. And the only thing about the information, the continuous information that we know is that it is periodic. We transform it into infinite, but discrete series of numbers the Fourier coefficients. In fact, this is exactly what is happening with the sound when you have analogical recording or digital recording, right? So these are the uh, LPs, the long playing desk, uh, discs, and these are CDs, or nowadays probably the uh, MP3 format coded music, right? We are coming with this to reciprocal lattice. Reciprocal lattice uh, is a set of vectors which help us to define the special frequencies that need to be uh, included for the Fourier transformation. Actually, if you think about the Fourier transformation, we need a set of frequencies here. And what is this set of frequencies? Well, it is a series of points, right? So we have a point here, which is at zero. That's for n equals zero. And for n equals one, we have a point, which is two pi over r, where r is the period. We have another point here, another frequency for n equals two, which is two pi over r times two. Right? Here we have a point, which is minus two pi over r and so on. So eventually we end up with a series of frequencies that need to be considered. And these uh, frequencies, they correspond to a 1D lattice. If this was a 2D signal, that means that we have a periodic function f x y, then the set of frequencies, discrete frequencies that we need to consider do form a 2D lattice. When we come to 3D periodic distribution, then we end up for the Fourier transformation with a 3D lattice. This lattice has a relationship to the real lattice. In a real space, we see that the points of the same signal are displaced by n times r, 
And this R, the periodicity of the signal, defines the spacing of the lattice points that define the frequencies. The longer is the period in the real space, the finer is the spacing in this reciprocal space. That is why it's called reciprocal, because the spacing of the points is reciprocal to the sort of spacing of points with the same frequency in the real space. So now, coming to the mathematical definition, if we have a lattice, a real space lattice, which is defined by vectors a1, a2, and a3, the reciprocal lattice vectors are then b1, b2, and b3 defined by these equations. Again, you can uh, you can train these or, or try to use these equations in the uh, task you are uh, given at the moment. Now, uh, there are certain relationships between these reciprocal and real space lattice points. So the points which are generated either by the uh, real lattice vectors or the reciprocal lattice vectors, namely that uh, these two vectors are perpendicular uh, if they are of different indices, and they would be parallel if they are the same. Uh, if they, well, they are not not parallel, no. But they are. They are. The, the point is that they are perpendicular if the indices i and j are different. Now, what is this delta? This is so-called Kronecker delta, which equals to one if i equals to j and equals to zero if i is different from, from j, right? Uh, so that means that if i and j are different indices, then this dot product is equal to zero and indeed a and b are perpendicular. Eventually, when we then use these reciprocal lattice vectors to define the reciprocal lattice, which is a set of these reciprocal uh, lattice points, then for these guys, we can uh, easily show that a very useful identity holds, namely this e to i g dot r, where g is a reciprocal vector and r is any real lattice vector is equal to one. And we'll be heavily using this later on in the electronic structure calculations. Excuse and me, could you repeat the definition of the delta? Maybe when yes. it's one, when it's zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so delta equals to zero if i is different from j and equals to one if i is equal to j. So if you would like to see this as a matrix, then it is essentially an identity matrix. Is it sufficient this way? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So this is now the identity uh, that will be heavily used later on when we will be evaluating the uh, electronic structure calculations. Good. And I have here last piece of information for you. Uh, I have mentioned the uh, reciprocal lattices already before when we were talking about the Wigner site cells. And I said that the Wigner site cells are used mostly in the reciprocal space where we then define the Brüllin zone. So the part of the reciprocal space con corresponding to each uh, lattice point uh, by these Wigner site cells. The advantage of doing this and the reason why we do this is that then the lattice point, the reciprocal lattice point, is always in the center of that Wigner site cell. So that we have the lattice point really in the center. And that, again, will be very much useful for the definition of the, uh, of the electronic structure. Now, uh, interesting thing is that if you try to evaluate what is the reciprocal lattice, corresponding to a direct FCC lattice, you will end up with a BCC reciprocal lattice. So actually, if you take reciprocal, uh, if you take FCC real lattice, 
and calculate the corresponding reciprocal lattice. The reciprocal lattice points correspond to a body-centered lattice. And vice versa. Okay. So at this point, I think this is more uh, a point of an interest that the relationship between BCC and FCC lattices is closer than one would think. Essentially, the direct BCC lattice is, uh, has a reciprocal FCC and vice versa. And finally, uh, this is at this point really just for an information and uh, we'll be talking about it much more later on, but it will be useful already for the phonons, for the diffraction, as well as for the electronic structure. Uh, there is a convention to call some very special points in the reciprocal lattice using some uh, letters, some symbols. So always the center of the reciprocal lattice uh, of the reciprocal lattice, the Wigner sites uh, point, uh, the Wigner site cell. So the center of the first brilliant zone is called the gamma point. This is a very prominent point with the highest symmetry uh, in the reciprocal space. And then depending on your uh, direct lattice symmetry, we get the different types of also high symmetry points in the reciprocal space. Um, again, conventionally labeled with these letters, um, very prominently, for example, the X point is always the center of this uh, uh, cubic phase. L point is the center of the hexagonal phase. Um, K would be the connection of a gamma point and another gamma point, so uh, of the uh, sorry, that's the L point, uh, between the gamma point and the center of the uh, neighboring Bruin zone. Um, they, these are called the gamma points. K points is then the connection or the middle point between, uh, or is the middle point of this uh, side connecting to hexagons and so on and so forth, right? Obviously, uh, for example, K points do not exist for the simple cubic cells because simple cubic cells do not contain any hexagonal facets uh, in their brilliant zone. The brilliant zone of a simple cubic cell, so simple cubic cell, really just a cube like that, is again a simple cubic cell. So then there is no hexagonal facet and therefore there is no K point, for example. 